we know that our universe is expanding. Brian Schmidt showed that the speed of this expansion is accelerating. John Mather detected cosmic background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang. Both of these revelations fundamentally change our view of the universe and pose huge questions for today's physicists. The laureates met with three young researchers to discuss the current state of astronomy and whether this is indeed a golden age in that field. Well, the golden age of astronomy, so I guess we want to know if it is. Um, from my perspective, it is, because this is a time when, uh, well, I'm not to say that there isn't going to be another golden age to follow, but we are now at a place where discoveries are being made at an extraordinary pace. Uh, because but this there's is also a, a lot more astronomers. And there are a lot more astronomers. Yeah, so we have more astronomers, and we also have more mm -hmm. wonderful equipment. Uh, the number of telescopes that are in space and on the ground and being built is just fantastic. My impression is the rate of discovery is continuing to increase. And so it's not, it can't always continue forever, but I think astronomers have at least a century's worth of marvelous ideas. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the things that were submitted to the decadal survey, mm -hmm. it'll take us a century to do them all. So, so there's, a, there's an issue there here, though, which is that although we've had a period of exponential growth, clearly from, with a couple of hiccups from when you came out of graduate school, and that has made life very golden for us because unlike your generation, our generation, there were enough professorships for almost every student created because of the exponential growth. Right. So I think astronomy itself is going to continue to, to grow, but I think our ability to increase funding, my guess, has leveled off. I think we have mm -hmm. seen the end of exponential growth and we are going to go into an equilibrium situation. I think that we will be judged on how we are able to resolve the problems that have been presented to us. So I think that we have been presented with this incredible problem of the cosmic acceleration. And alongside that, the, the question of the cosmological constant problem. Honestly, I think that in you know 50 years time, we're going to be judged on whether we were able to come to any conclusions about the problem. So, so I don't disagree that progress on the cosmic acceleration has been woefully slow in the last 13 years. <laughs> Not for lack of trying. Certainly. We're using a sledgehammer. Uh, going yes. out trying to chop down trees in a very large forest. Yeah, but are we looking at the right thing? Well, I yes. don't know. So I think that we need to be very open to ideas. But astronomy and physics is bigger than just cosmic acceleration. Sure, I mean, sure, sure. It's been very good to me, but it's bigger than that. We have the idea that we're being able to the first time to look back to when the first stars, galaxies, black holes form. Okay, there are some big questions. We still don't know what dark matter is. How should we go about answering these questions? We've got all these people doing studying, looking at stars, galaxies, looking at all this incremental stuff. Should we refocus astronomy? Should we call the people that aren't doing good astronomy? Oh, no. What, what no. or how I mean, they how, how Who is to say? Right, who's, exactly. Who's doing... But then no. I think yeah. the process. This is why I disagree that it's a golden age. John Mather was correct when he said it was a golden age for observational astronomy. Mm -hmm. I disagree with that. Like 20 years ago, really? they were saying exactly the same thing. They launched the Great Observatories. Yeah. That was 20 years ago. Yeah, maybe 20 that's years part ago, they the same age. It's not too up to us, let's say, to decide if it's golden age or, or not. I mean, You're this right, is really yeah. something that you yeah. know, it's the people within people. exactly future people will decide what exactly. is the golden age and which one was it. It's not people within this age that can actually decide if we are the good yeah. ones or not. I mean. I don't think there's any way to hypothesize that it's a golden age for theoretical physics that touches on questions in astronomy and astrophysics because we haven't had any really new innovative ideas. But in observational astronomy there no, have been, right? Yeah, that, that's we've true. We've discovered cosmic acceleration, we've discovered extrasolar planets. Right. But we don't even know where yeah. to go. But I think, you know... We can only see 5% of the material that makes up our universe. Astronomers call the rest of it dark matter and dark energy but we don't really understand what these are. Well, my thought is, well, if we don't know something, that's the golden age of astronomy. It's a question to work on. Um, the questions that we don't know answers to are really hard. Um, dark matter is actually transparent. It's invisible. Uh, astronomers can tell that it's there because it has gravity, but this is a fundamentally hard problem. The dark energy that uh, got the Nobel Prize this last time um, is even harder to study because not only uh, does it not emit light? It doesn't even uh, change uh, what you see very much, so it's a very hard thing to work on. We may never find out what that is, or we may need a discovery from some completely different direction, like the Hadron Collider or uh, a theorist. Do you think that we are making the right decisions on that front? 
It is my honest belief that dark energy will be figured out by a theorist, not by an observer. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong, though. That's mm -hmm. why W first is interesting. If I had my druthers, I would be spending more money on theorists and people. I like that. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> but I have a similar feeling. I, I've been on committees about the dark energy and what we should do. And mm -hmm. I kept asking the theorists, well, what is, theory are we testing? And they didn't, yeah. any of them, have a theory that we were testing that they liked. Yeah. So yeah. I thought, well, nothing we can do as astronomers, as measurement people, is going to change any of that. We need the next Stephen Hawking or the next Einstein to actually come up with this thing that makes sense, right. which we don't have yet. Yep. So what so would you like from a theorist, let's say? You something, know, and I, I, I... One model or uh, some feature which characterizes more model and that he can actually test? Even close, I can yeah. measure. Give me... A signature. Give me a signature that yeah. I, as an observer, mm -hmm. can go out and test. But another oh. way of thinking of it is, well, you can't always look under the light post for the keys. You have to sort of be alert to other things where maybe we're just not even thinking of the right thing mm -hmm. to think about. And uh, so you really can't devote all of your effort to just one big project. We better do everything else that might relate. So I actually really appreciated that they both emphasized that there was room for theorists and emphasized the importance of theorists. I found that really refreshing because, yeah. well, Especially said by since we're theorists, <laughs> but it's particularly, it's, um, it's great coming yeah, from yeah. observers that they are really understanding. And maybe in that sense, we are in a golden age of understanding. <laughs> Science is sometimes uh, subject to revision. It's a good thing to go out and measure and see what the universe does because the one thing I have learned in life is that one should not prejudge the universe. The universe does what it wants and our job as scientists are to figure it out rather than, than to assume it should be the way we want it to be. I never imagined in my wildest dreams 30 years ago we'd be able to simulate the formation of the first galaxies with the moving particles of dark matter. It shouldn't be surprising that uh, invisible matter and, and, and dark energy are a complete challenge to yep. see. And, and they're going to remain a challenge will. <laughs> until some breakthrough happens. And so It could be 50 years or 100 and, and years so before I, that smart person appears. And I think theory is really important to solve those things. But on the other hand, observers like me, the question is, should we be doing these great big projects? And the answer is, I say, yeah, 20% of our effort should go into those big problems, but we need to continue to look for planets, to look for stars and understand how the f galaxy was born, yeah. understanding how you know, stars are born, all these, these questions. It's a very rich subject still, and so it is still a golden age, although I would say maybe not quite as golden, because golden age is not the absolute level, it's the rate of change. And so I think we're in the exponential growth that's going to slow down a little bit. But it's still a great area mm -hmm. uh, to be in. It's not going to crash, I think, tomorrow. The, the mm -hmm. thing is, though, there's so much pressure to publish. If you don't publish, you're not going to get a job out of your PhD. If you don't publish, you're not going to get another post off after you've, you know. There, there's no time to actually sit there and think about the big questions. There's so much incremental science going on. How, how would you say we can combat this problem? And is that actually the best way for science, for postdocs and graduate students to be under that kind of publication pressure? I had that actually. I, I was hired as a civil servant. They couldn't fire me, but they also couldn't promote me until sure. I wrote papers. <laughs> so I had to write some papers too. So in my case, I started off with a bunch of papers after my PhD, and then I started the project that eventually mm -hmm. I got the Nobel Prize for, and that did slow my publication rate down and for me, I took the risk. I said, well, this is a big project. It was a high profile project. And it was very clear we weren't going to have a lot of papers initially. So from mm -hmm. 1996 and 1997, I effectively didn't publish any papers those two years. But 1998, I yeah. published papers that got 15,000 citations. So yeah. it was worthwhile. I was blown away when John kind of started out by saying I was as tired as a civil servant and then I was presented mm -hmm. with this challenge of well they can't promote me if I don't get any papers published. And they can't fire me. But, and like look yeah. you know if not getting a promotion is your biggest problem yeah, right. then I'm Except happy. <laughs> I don't think it's actually any harder for students today than it was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago but each student has to go through that period of worry about what they're going to do. So uh, when I was a student people said no you can't do what you want to do there's no job in that field. So um, it happens to me, it happens to most people. Well, you can come to me and say, I've got this problem. I can be like, well, we can do this, this, and this with the yeah. current telescope. Yes. Yeah. You can't do that until this. Yeah, then I think Keep going on and trying to solve the mysteries of the universe, but don't worry 
too much about your exact future. Go in, work for the present, do the best you can, because the future will sort of take care of itself. And, you know, I can't guarantee you're going to get a job as an astronomer, but I think you will have a good, happy life if you do something that you enjoy.